Uh, hello and um, welcome to, to the to the next edition of Plan Talk. Um, I'm really pleased today we've got Sama joining us from um, a number of different places. Um, but before we introduce Sama, there's just a couple of bits of housekeeping. Um, the format of these talks are always the same, which is about 15 minutes of presentation on a specialist subject with Q&A afterwards. Um, the Q&A, if you want to put, as, we, as Sam is talking, um, if you want to put any questions you've got in the box, I think it's on that side, um, that'd be really great. Um, and they get fed through to me um, and I'll, I'll kind of put them together if we get bundles of questions. So, Sam, um, I'm really kind of terrified of you because you're far cleverer than me. But, uh, so to introduce Sam, Sam um, heads up, um, is Professor of Planning at the University of Kent? Um, in the School of Planning and Architecture, which is, um, we were just discussing, it's the second planning school you've set up in the southeast. so I could tell to your greatness. Yeah. You're, yeah. You're, you're driving the future of planners, which is exciting. Um, and also you're a councillor at Brighton & Hove, so you've got quite an interesting insight to give us. Um, but before we go into, into questions, we'll give you your 15 minutes of speak, speaking. So I'll turn my camera and microphone off and over to you to talk about 5G. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. And hopefully everybody can hear me OK. Um, so this is it's an interesting presentation, this one, how we came about it. So hopefully what I'm what I'm going to walk you through here is 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 interesting and, and and relevant. And it's in two parts. It's the current status quo and the tensions. But also then in the second part, it's more looking forward about where the innovation could come from and what it means um, for, for all of us. And I thought I'll start with this. You know, it's, it's funny, the cell, cell tower runs amok thing. It's, uh, uh, you know, we've all seen the 5G mosque being burned down on account of causing coronavirus, which we know is not true. We don't want to spend, uh, start uh, spreading any rumors. Um, but more importantly, the number of connections and if you look the number on your left, which is the 8 billion, 800 uh, and 5 million and so on. So that's your mobile connections, but it also includes your IoT cellular connections. OK, so you can see there's actually substantially more in that left hand figure than the right hand figure. And that's effectively how many cellular IoT devices we have. We have out there over and above the unique mobile subscribers, which is the individual numbers that all of us uh, carry in our in our mobile phones in, in, in our pockets. And you could see the growth in that number on the on the left is actually more than the growth in the number on the right. So we're seeing more and more IoT, IoT devices out there. And you know you can you can you can be assured that actually they will in the main operate on 5G networks when these are up and up and running. Um, a bit of history, so 2G, 3G, 4G, and 5G. Um, and, and, you know, so there's the story there about calls and texts, moving on to videos and uh, mobile broadband on, on the go. And then we move into 5G territory, and these are the things I'm going to come back to later on. So the ultra-high speed and the ultra-low latency, and these are the two where effectively a lot of the innovation is gonna is gonna come in. Uh, in terms of you know where we are currently with with COVID, so the GSMA, the GSM Association, the trade body for the mobile phone operators globally has been issuing stats and monitoring the market on on 5G adoption. Uh, so supplies are suffering. We know that uh, you know. So month on month smartphone shipments from China you know, dropped in January and dropped again in, in February. And, you know, we're waiting for the data to see what they're what they're doing for May, May and June. But I suspect they kind of dropped again in between. And the intelligence on the adoption of 5G. So while everybody was expecting 5G to go, uh, you know, uh, into, into full operational mode in 2020, um, there's been a reduction in, in the expected number of connections. Um, but in most cases, and you'll see there, they expect it to be back on track within within a couple of within a couple of years. Uh, there's a lot of organisations doing some really interesting stuff on 5G, and one of them is the impact to industry, society, and and, and the economy. As that's one of the areas that's 
that's interesting to probe into um, a bit more. So the World Economic Forum with PwC did a report, and this was published earlier this year, quantifying the business case and the potential social value of 5G. So it's an interesting read. I'm not going to take you through it, but I thought I'd flag that. And then this massive chart from Raconteur. And the interesting piece here is the 5G roadmap, which you'll see in that sort of lower right hand corner. And you see there the as we move from trials into adoption and common use of things like AR and VR, augmented reality and virtual reality, smart cities and autonomous vehicles. And you can see the trigger points, you know, so for autonomous vehicles, it's 20, 2022 going into 2023, for example. So the, these are really important points that should, you know, in time that we should be aware of. Keeping an eye on what happens on account of COVID, but you know, that's the roadmap if you like that we that we have now taking that an, a notch down into cities you know uh, peter said i'm in brighton and hove and, and we are one of those 5g test beds we've been a 5g test bed you know since september 2018 i can't tell you what we've done as a 5g test bed somebody else can but i think very very little you know i'm, I'm kind of still not seeing much impact of these 5g test beds linked to the catapults um Competitiveness, yes, we know data is very important to us. The digital economy is a big part uh, of what we're doing. Have we got the infrastructure? Not yet, but that's the sort of infrastructure that, uh, and the 5G infrastructure and the mass that are coming through. But that's, again, where the tensions are, are beginning to build up as well. So enthusiasm for 5G going strong, this is a piece from last last month now, middle of middle of May. So we're still seeing that back 5G as the backbone for Europe's economic recovery. And I think we'll hear that more and more as things go on. But the stumbling block for me, and this is a very simplified version of, you know, where could the issues um, come up? And if you like, you know, it's the landscape itself is very difficult because there's so many actors and organizations that are involved, you know, from government, local government, the networks, the regulator, and then even in local government, those tensions between economy, health, and planning, for example, are really a big part of, of that 5G puzzle. And then below that, I've put the note that said, look, senior management and local authority have yet to formally discuss the impact of 5G on the local authority, despite recognizing the transformative effect it will have on things like IT and industry, housing and social services and so on. So we get things like this come up in the news every now and again, you know, masks installed and, you know, the local authority refusing planning permission, saying masks would create visual clutter. Okay, I mean, that's effectively the reason most are giving for refusing masks um, like these, you know, but they know the council knows and they've got, you know, councillors definitely know that they cannot use the planning system to hold the rollout of 5G because of government regulations. So what do they do? You know, objectors come in and they, you know, this, this I've given you an example here, you know, the impact on schools and children, for example, that's cited as one. Um, in the recent debate, this is in May, so only four weeks ago, a tough decision for most of the committee during a virtual meeting. Wednesday, the 6th of May, neighbors sent in 115 letters. Councillors questioned what benefit it would bring to the area. Well, we know about the economic benefits of 5G. You know, none of that is new. So there is an element here of speaking to the media more than, more than anything else. We've had in Brighton the uh, issue with the petition and the impact of 5G on health to just a uh, you know, little over 2,000 signatures. And we've had the legal view, local authorities cannot lawfully refuse an application for prior approval on health counts because of the potential health issues linked to 5G are not relevant to citing and appearance. You know, I mean, you guys will probably know that already. And the RTPI, I think they responded to the MHCLG consultation on 5G and permitted development rights earlier in the uh, tail end of last, last year. Um, one thing they highlight, which I, for me was very interesting, is reducing opportunities for community participation likely to lead to strong resistance. And that's happening in effect. And I think it will it will probably only, only escalate. Now, in terms of COVID, what has it done to our existing infrastructure? 
So when all of us started working from home, uh, I think it was Vodafone that it had to shift effectively 70% of its network capacity from areas where there are offices to areas to residential areas. And they did that very quickly. So they had flexibility in, in, in the network. They couldn't do it everywhere. Uh, you know, some areas are better served than by 4G than others. And there are a few things here that I've said might need to change uh, in, in the future. Certainly utilities, I think, will have a role to play as we increase the penetration of 5G in residential areas, presumably as more and more people stay stay at home and, and do the work from home. Do we need 5G? You know, it's, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a tough one, but it has to be a yes. But it's a yes, but. So we need to be able to understand what the tensions are what issues people are um, expressing concern about about 5G and so on, whether it's the equipment, whether it's the health aspects and so on. But we have to recognize as the World Economic Forum, PWC and others would say, look, there is an element here about industrial innovation, manufacturing as we move uh, and the increase in automation as we move away uh, from from the COVID effect into the next normal, the new normal, whatever whatever that um, looks like. Uh, gamers, um, as somebody who's recently bought for the kids an Oculus Quest, I can tell you they eat up a lot of it eat up a lot of data. 5G would it make a difference for them? Yes, and it's the latency piece I mentioned at the start. Uh, for that to work effectively, the same as in healthcare, which is the other section I'm going to come into the other sector, you need low latency. And by low latency, it means you need as little a delay as possible between pressing a button and something happening. And, and here, you know, a character taking action, for example, if you, if you are a gamer. We notice a big difference when we look at autonomous vehicles. So if you look at that sketch with the two cars, 4.6 feet for a 4G car to apply its brakes versus just an inch for a 5G car to apply its brakes. And that's the difference that low latency actually makes. It's the quicker, it's the quicker response time. And I think this will be crucial in terms of the safety of autonomous vehicles when they are up and running 2022, 2023, if that remains our, our uh, if you like, the point in time where that's going to happen. The same for healthcare as well. So we talk about rural areas and access to telehealth and so on and so forth. But the impact of that low latency on imaging equipment and the sending of x-rays and you know transmitting that large file here, expanding telemedicine, using AR and VR, effectively simulating complex medical procedures and scenarios. 5G will make a huge difference, and there are a few pilots going on in the Northeast at the moment uh, as part of a big consortium where I think, the, again, the GSM Association is also part of that. So the few things there, you know, I think, you know, for some of us, gaming is interesting. For some of us in infrastructure, the point about autonomous vehicles is interesting, but in healthcare, I think, given that we've all had to, you know, see our doctors remotely over the last few weeks, and months and maybe we'll have to do so into the future. I think this becomes a really important aspect of how we how we do things in the future. And, and the same for gaming. I'll flick quickly th through that. But effectively, the latency piece, you know, that round trip time to get the data from the mobile user to the network and back, uh, you know, and you've got a comparison there. It's 20 millisecond. I mean, ideally, that's what you want it to be. Average in the UK is 50. If you're on a fiber optic uh, broadband connection, it's 15, and that's what we want. And that's where effectively you'll begin to feel the impact of, of 5G for, for uh, the industry. And that should, in effect, transform those gaming experiences. Um, and yeah, given examples here, just, you know, surgeons using the Oculus Rift VR. Um, yeah, it, it'll have, you know, it will have impact on, on how we experience cities, particularly if we can't go off and visit other places. It'll have impact on interior design, fashion, the military. You know, this will be big for a lot of sectors. And going back to the point about councillors not knowing what the utility of a 5G piece of kit is, I think these are the messages uh, 
uh, you know, that we need to get out there, but also begin to make the connections as to how, for example, planning how we experience community engagement and so on would become um, different as a result of this. Having done a virtual walk for a neighborhood forum earlier in the week, you know, on a 4G connection, it worked really well, but you know, I couldn't but think what it would look like on a 5G connection as well, because there were a few of us down in Brighton and a, and a few and a few people up in London as well. And I think, Peter, that's me done there. That's fantastic. That was really interesting. Um, and I, I, I think you've actually covered quite a, a difficult and potentially painful <laughs> subject. Yeah. Um, and I, I think the, the fact you're coming at it from both sides of the fence gives you a really kind of unique insight um, into both what, what politicians are thinking, but also yeah. what, uh, what, what, what the market might start to think. Um, yeah. Detailed questions that I kept careful to try and steer carefully past. But do you think the growth, one of the arguments that people are, are kind of putting across is to have how this will change society? Yeah. or has the potential to change society and we need to think about how we structure ourselves um, to be ready for it. But one of the conversations is about whether it um, results in people being de-skilled as you have um, just perhaps a small handful of specialists basically telling the rest of us like robots what to do if in, in, in dealing with quite complex matters like I I've seen lots of use cases like around water, around electronics, around things like that. Um, do you have a view on whether we're going to go that far or is it going to be the 1984 effect or is it going to be something a little bit lighter? Uh, that's an interesting one. And I, and I look, I mean, again, it's, you know, I mean, you and I can sit here and, you know, everybody else who's who's watching and listening, you know, can can talk about 5G, I think, to, to some respect. None of us, for example, are telecom specialists and so on and so forth. So there is an element there about the knowledge that we have that's actually very important for the folks in the telecoms business that they, may, might, they might not necessarily be aware of to the same extent that we are, for example. If you like, this is where I think that those boundaries between the disciplines and the areas become blurred. In effect, I don't think this is going to end up being about a telecoms person or a data or a tech person doing all the work because they can't do it in isolation. You know, I think you need that engagement of the social scientists, the scientists, the planners, the architects, the surveyors, and so on. That 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 has to be important. I mean, we've seen that in the COVID response, you know, this thing about politics versus the science, but nobody talks about the social science. In effect, we were kind of that that territory where social science got squeezed out somehow. But I think in, in this particular case, in terms of 5G, because you've got the multiple actors, I've laid out for you, know, and communities you saw there, they're a key part of this, you know, and they have interests and they have something to say. But I think, again, the messaging needs to be from us and, and from others is that, look, we understand there are issues with health. We understand there are issues with visual immunity and so on, and they cut across different things. But actually, there are benefits. Now, let's begin to look at what those benefits look like, because the, those are the ones that will cut across all of our disciplines and, if you like, our areas of work. Uh, and I don't know that we've done that very well. You know, it's, I mean, you know, I've, I've, I've said it there, you know, you've got counselors saying, well, we don't know what the benefit is. And like, well, of course you do. You know, you know, if, I mean, if you don't, then what's the point of all those reports telling you what the benefits of 5G are? You know, but again, you can't retreat and escape. You really get to put yourself out there and think and explain what those are and then maybe expose some of the tensions. So, so I, I think that's really good, and I, I think we, as a society, we probably need to start having that conversation as to what we really want that to look like. And I don't think there's a forum for that. Yeah. But um, and to put, take it on to the next question, because I think this I could I could sit in a pub and discuss that that particular point for about three weeks. Um, the, the 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 next question was, um, what was Brighton hoping to get out of being a five G test bed? Because it was a big commitment to do, and what what were they trying to get? There, there, there was. Um, 
And you know, if if I go back, it's probably now five years that we got together when, and quite frankly, I don't know what's happened to our, you know, chief technology officer that was in place five years ago. You don't, I don't hear much of him. I mean, he might not even be there. I should know as a councillor, but I'm afraid I don't. <laughs> Uh, I don't because it just doesn't doesn't come up. It's all about the economy. Um, but you know, we wanted to look at integrated ticketing. This is going back five years. So we sat a whole bunch of people around the table from the bus company, Southern Railway. I think the Catapult were there. You know, officers were there, and a couple of other NGOs were there. And and you know, it was at at that point it, the officers said, "Oh, we're going to take that away, and and we'll see what we could." we'll see what we could do and i don't think we've done anything with that you know over the years there have been things coming up to the surface like oh we're going to put sensors so you know where to park for example you know so really really basic um stuff that didn't happen you know the parking app uh well okay but that's fine but that's an app it's not really about data could we get the data from the parking app you, can we find out where people are parking no, you can't get that data. Well, who owns that data? Well, the company that runs the parking app does, not the council. You know, and and so so you end up having those conversations where you know that there is data out there which should be sitting in in the test bed, which effectively acts more than an incubator. I think it's it's like an incubator and a common co-working space to bring the little startup community together at this moment in time, rather than say somebody that curates data. For the city and it became very clear in the covid situation where there was very little data available on infection rates mm. you know it's it's again why can't we have data on infection why can't there be a local body as part of the test bed that picks up the public health england data is no because that data is centralized and it lives some, somewhere else and we don't have access to it here in the city I mean, I would have looked to the testbed for a leadership role in this. You know, it, if it's a personal opinion, I do not think it's there. You know, again, like I said, it's great for networking. It's great for seeing what the startups are doing and so on. I'm sure the startups get a lot of support from the Catapult team in the city. Mm. Uh, but there's very little engagement in terms of, you know, using data to kind of become the engine of the city's economy. You know, you could map tourist numbers and, you know, map the way tourists move around the city and so on would have been great, you know, as we approach social distancing differently. Um, but we're not doing any of that. So maybe we've, we've, got, a, we've got a bit of a way to go here. No, but I, I, I wouldn't take that as a big, as a big uh, yoke. Yeah. I think that's something yeah. that public bodies haven't really grappled with full yeah. stop. And yeah. the fact that they're actually the most powerful data churning opportunities, but they yeah. don't kind of harness that to shape how they, they they drive that. But there's one really interesting point that you touched on at the start, which has been kind of picked up, which is around um, how this is going to change how people work. And, and has the COVID-19 crisis driven the adoption of 5G or has mm. it slowed it down? Yeah, no, and that's an interesting one. And you saw the data coming through from the GSM Association effectively saying, look, well, the the number of connections is decreasing, which is fair enough because there's less smartphones coming out of the factories or less IoT devices coming out of the factories. I mean, there might be different reasons for that. But in terms of the new normal <clears throat> or the next or the, or the next normal, as, as more and more people work work from home. Uh, and I touch on, uh, if you've noticed, the, um, the cable 5G, for example, you know, so there are opportunities there. And I think that's where you need probably a more integrated conversations with the utilities firm, A, to understand um, what the current landscape is like. I mean, I know I sat in on a call with Vodafone last, last last month and they said look well we've had to shift 70 percent of our of our activity to the residential area and i need to unpick what other data they have and i know you know apart from that first week when you know a bunch of us you know well, all of us went to work from from home um the network struggled a bit i think you know you know for the first two three four five days i certainly was on the phone to vodafone you know 
you know, two or three times a day for the first few days. And, 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 and then it was absolutely fine. But you could see there were shifting things mm. ac across. But again, if a lot, if people decide to go back to the office, if they can go back to the office, you know, there's separate conversations happening about what the future office will look like. And in a way, again, going back to the data point, but we need an, a, then an integrated conversation about, you yeah. know, you know, do we then take the data back and shift it back to where the offices are, or do we keep the bandwidth in the residential area and so on? You know, is there enough bandwidth in the system for both? You know, because you can't have people working in the office on, you know, 50% bandwidth, and then the same for people working at home. It, it doesn't really work. And I think that's where you kind of need to get the networks and the regulator and say, right, guys, what is your network capacity? What do you need to happen? Where do you need to expand? You know, and so forth. Should we accelerate 5G? You know, um, and what does that mean in terms of, you know, more masts appearing and so on and so forth? It opens up another set of questions. Which leads me on to my next kind of big question, uh, which is around actually the rollout of infrastructure. Um, I have to admit, I'm I'm kind of not desperate to get a 5G phone because I, mm. I think there's some really interesting questions because of a, a lot of the feedback I hear is about um, people not getting good signal inside their house. Yeah. Um, I just wondered if there's a relation, in your opinion, whether there's a relationship between that challenge of um, the, the low latency frequency not being able to pass through walls or all sorts of other kind of statements and it, its adoption and rollout of, of infrastructure. Yeah, I mean, you've you've got the so you've got the physical infrastructure itself in the form of new cabinets and 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 masts and everything else, and I think that in itself. Is, is, is a challenge, you know. I mean, those 20 meter masts that replace the 12 meter 4G masts, you know, it's, I've, I've not seen a single one put up here, even though there's been a few few applications that have um, gone through the system. Um, but they're a tough one, I think, for people to get used to. Uh, you know, so I think we need to do a bit more work, or at, at least the operators and their agents need to be a bit more creative in terms of what that equipment um looks like i i don't know about the latency and and walls you know because ultimately if you go back and ask the networks they say yeah but you know 4g telecommunications it's meant to be used outdoors you're not really you know it wasn't designed to be used indoors uh in effect to start with um but it's it's funny even even the 4g signal uh, at some point. I mean, my, my phone is not a 5G phone, but this morning it was on 3G. It's like, well, okay, and I know there's parts in town, for example, by the station where you should be getting good signal and, you know, it drops, you don't even get, get 3G. Uh, you know, so we still have gaps in the networks. And I think, you know, for us to jump back to full 5G capacity, I think it's going to take us a while. It'll be interesting to see the areas where it is operating. And I think there's a few cities where it's already up and running. I don't know whether Bristol and Greater Manchester come to mind, but I think, you know, there are places where where it is up and up and running already. It'll be interesting to see what difference it has made, both outdoors and indoors. Uh, I think, again, that's a case of getting that data and seeing what we can do with it. I think there's, there's um somebody's asked a question about the rollout of 5g in london and the, mm. the challenge of not spots um i don't think we probably should deal with that here because um yeah. a the chief digital officer for london will kill me if i get it wrong but but b yeah. um it's, been, yeah. I know it's an ongoing discussion um, well i think i think i mean on that i think the majority of the boroughs do not have a strategy for dealing with a 5g rollout i mean that's something i've come across i think it's something like you know 31 do not which I think only leaves two that do, you know. So it's a long way to go, probably. And certainly, I know that from the London Borough's perspective, they haven't done looked at what the opportunities okay. there are to do commercial track commercial deals around um, the sighting of, of of signals and stuff, stuff yeah. like that. So I know there's some really really interesting kind of difficult questions um i, I do apologize um there's also a question in so it's just come in that covered a whole new new area that we just cover and then we probably have to wrap up um, okay question is do we really need 5g at the time 
because uh, well i suppose it's really weighing up the environmental impact against yeah. of of rolling out the infrastructure for 5g and 5g as a principle yeah. um, do we really need it is the economic benefit to society that big yeah i mean again it's you know i i touched upon if you like the stuff that the World Economic Forum are doing about quantifying the business case, but more importantly, that social value component. And that social value aspect then cuts across multiple areas that impact on people's lives. And I think that's, I think certainly we need to look at those. You know, we're doing a lot of stuff on social value across multiple industries. And, you know, certainly 5G and how that produces or enhances social value is not something that's been looked at yet in some detail. And that's maybe something we, we need to spend a bit more time on. You know, yeah. you've, I, I've mentioned gaming and health, you know, because they, you know, there's the obvious one. To two groups. Yeah. And it's, and, you know, autonomous vehicles as well. So there are areas where it will clearly make a difference. Autonomous vehicles, it should make them safer. And I think that's the important thing there. And with healthcare, it should make again procedures safer, uh, and and therefore you know probably will increase the uptake. But again, who knows? It's all in the realm of you know this could happen and that could happen for this at, at this moment in time. You know until we see these things actually take off, it's difficult to say where the value is going to come from. Really, is where it's going to come. I think from. that kind of feeds into the whole five G create bid rounds and things like that, yeah. doesn't it? And yeah. Um, yeah. there's, there's just one final question, um, which um, is a question we're asking all of our speakers, and you've actually got quite a unique insight coming from academia as well, which is clearly we're going to enter into some time of change uh, with with kind of some economic uncertainty. Um, and traditionally, when we've entered this, it's been quite a hard time for people coming into the planning system um, and planning industry. Um, planning schools traditionally closed down, all, all kind of the jobs become more challenging. Um, what would you, what what would your advice to people in that position be? So the the advice in terms of you know how to embrace the change, how, how to get into the planning system, and what would your advice be about about about, yeah. about what to focus on? I mean, it's 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 an interesting one because you know you you you'll have seen the debates shifting up to um, you know. We talk about planning, but we also talk about building back better. We talk about planning, but we also talk about building resilience. We talk about, you know, chief planning officers, but we also talk about resilient leadership and so on. So the way things are being described out there to the general public are interesting. And I think we just need to make sure, you know, certainly the program in Kent is planning and resilience because they're very important. You know, and when we set out to do that two years ago, you know, I don't think any of us could have imagined how important that conversation is going to be at this at, at this moment in time. But I think is making sure that planning sits at the heart of that because you know it it's there. It's even in the 5G conversation, it's there alongside the economy, alongside health, it's there for communities and, and so on and so forth. It's you know, I think we're there. We're you know, people will say we're the leaders in the local authorities who can actually lead and should lead, but aren't actually in the leadership positions, you know, um, you know, as has happened, you know, our position has, has eroded over a number of years. But I think it's important, our position, because people look up to us, you know, they see planners as the ones that are able to weigh the pros and cons and actually make a, a rational informed decision. Very few other people in the local authority are able to do that, you know, so, you know, we, we just need to stick with it, but we also need to be aware, I think, of what's happening around us. You know, we can't retreat into the planning silo and say, look, you know, this is what we do. Actually, what we do cuts across multiple areas. You know, I mean, when I, when they, when, by, when our group said, oh, you're a planner, do you want to go sit on the planning committee last year? I said, no, I want to sit on the health and well-being board. And actually it's been terrific, you know, because a then I'm able to ask the questions that cut across things that the others can't, you know, because yeah. that's how we that's how we're built to think. It's it's, you know? it's training to think in a 360 way, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. You know, so oh, that's, that's really insightful. Thank you. The career to to be in. <laughs> I strongly agree, actually. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, thank you so much for, for, for giving this talk and, and, and answering some quite quite challenging questions. So I really do appreciate it. Um, it's only there's two more pieces of housekeeping. Firstly, to say thank you so much to Natalie and Lucy for making making it all happen. Um, one day I may make them appear on here. Um, and then the, 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 the final bit is that once we've finished um, this recording, we will be putting it on YouTube. So you'll be able to view it on, um, if you just put in hashtag plan talk into YouTube, you'll be able to find the channel. Um, so thank you ever so much. And that's it for today. Thank you, Peter.